Pushyamitra Sunga. He was the final founder of the dynasty. Pushyamitra Sunga. So he was the commander of the Mauryan armies. So he was a, I mean, he was a, we can say, a Hindu, a bit of radical ideas. So he killed the last ruler of Maina, uh, Maurya dynasty and uh, he started the new dynasty, Sunga dynasty. Good evening students, welcome back to Plutus IS. Right, today is our 62nd day. 62nd day and today we are discussing the post Mauryan period. Okay, so once the, um, I mean Mauryans, uh, we have studied in the previous class that the after Ashoka, we have seen a series of weak rulers and um, that dynasty has, Mauryan dynasty has ended by uh, Sunga dynasty, Pushyamitra Sunga was the commander of the Mauryans and uh, he ended the uh, Maurya dynasty. So in the previous class, like I uh, said it wrongly, I said Kanva, uh, Kanva dynasty after uh, Maurya's Kanva, Kanva dynasty has uh, started and one ruler from the Kanva dynasty ended the Maurya rule. So that's uh, incorrect, please correct it. After the Maurya's, the Shunga dynasty has started. So the Sungas have ruled uh, the I mean empire, the Magadhan empire for some time, making the capital, I mean making the capital Pataliputra, Pataliputra as their capital. So after Shungas, the Kanvas overthrowing Sunva, uh, Sungas, the Kanvas have come to rule uh, uh, of the Magadhan empire, the same place Pataliputra as their capital. So please make this correction right so i have uh, as i uh, we have discussed earlier so after the mighty rule of Ma maurya has ended we will see a series of dynasties until again the rise of guptans until again the rise of guptans we will see uh, a series of dynasties both some of the dynast uh, dynasties were indigenous i mean uh, they have emerged within India like the Sun Sungas, the Kanvas and the Satavahanas. So Satavahanas also they are a native dynasty. So in the absence of we can say dominant power in India. So <coughs> they have played, I mean they were dominant for a long period of time. So their kingdom extended uh, from south to uh, northern part of the country. Right. Apart from these three dynasties, we will also see some Central Asian incursions. So these Central Asian incursions were also very, very important. So in that we will see the Indo-Greeks, Indo-Greek kingdom also we will see, the Kushan Empire also we will see. Apart from that, we will also have Sakas. Sakas, they are also known as Indo-Scythians. Next, we will also see the Parthians. Parthians or they are also known as Indo-Parthians. Indo-Parthians. They are also sometimes known as the Yavanas. Indo-Parthians are also known as Yavanas. So they are uh, called by, uh, they are known with the different, different, different names in different sources. So I mean generally there are Indian names and there are also Indo-Greek names. So uh one thing is one thing is uh i mean these uh, these are generally the central asian uh, i mean the, these whatever central asian dynasties that have uh, some a part of india uh, as their uh, we can say part of their kingdom they belong to different tribes they belong to different tribes of the central asian region so because of the changing political scenario there some of the tribes have driven by more powerful or we can say tribes in the uh, Central Asian region or above the uh, region above Central Asia. So they came downwards and southwards and they have made their incursions into India. Right. You will see various dynasties. Most prominent among them is the 
Kushan dynasty and you know a famous well was named that is Kanishka so he is considered as the uh, greatest rulers among all the central asian rulers and we will also see how the all these rulers of all these dynas- dynasties have also adapted the indian ways and also sometimes not sometimes majority of the times they have adapted the local religion local indian religions also example is the kushans themselves they have in the later part of their uh, we can say rule they have become indianized and they adapted the that time one of the dominant religions apart from the uh, buddhism and jainism uh, the bhagavatism bhagavatism they have adapted this bhagavatism we will see in this lecture only how they have in the later part of the their rule they have uh, adapted bhagavatism and how they have indigenized so apart from that so there are we can say uh, that period time that period of time so uh, they have though they have come from outside india so they have filled they have filled the lack of strong empire gap of uh, lack of strong empire in india and they provided some kind of stability stability and continuity in the india especially the uh, northern and especially most especially the northwestern part of india apart from that india has also connected to the trade routes of the central asia and which were up after they are reaching central asia again they were convert con- connected with other regions like europe and byzantine empire etc so the famous uh, we can say one of the most famous uh, trade routes is silk road so india has because of the central asian kingdoms it has connected to the this particular silk road also right so apart from that we will say a lot of cultural exchange the indian practices have been adopted by the central asians and the central asian practices most of the some of the central asian practices that have also given to indians so the uh, we can say the minted coins especially the gold coins that have been introduced by central asians only the kushans and uh, the equipment that makes easy the horse ride like iron stirrup the saddle uh, to properly sit etc these all these things have been uh, given by the i mean brought by the central asians only so apart from if you see that the art and architecture if you see the sphere of art and architecture we will see a tremendous growth or tremendous improvement tremendous change so the greco roman features have been brought into india uh, by these uh, central asian rulers only we will because of that we will see also see an emergence of uh, we can say special style of uh, art and architecture that is the gandhara style gandhara style of art we will see so the sculpture it is prominently seen in the uh, making of the culture we will see n number of buddhist statues which are built in the gandhara style so especially there is a special relationship between the gandhara art and the buddhism so all these rulers who who ever have come to india they have patronized the local religions here uh, like uh, the uh, buddhism some have adopted the bhagavatism etc so over time they have come to india and they have indigenized uh, indigena uh, indigenized and also hinduized right so this is the thing right so dynasty as uh, dynasty after dynasty we will see the uh, dynasty and uh, the prominent rulers in that dynasty right so uh, try to follow clearly right so whatever the cultural contribution is there we are not going to cover here uh, i will going to cover that in the uh, art and architecture topics when i cover the art and culture part there we will discuss in detail about the contribution of central asian uh, rulers Uh, for the art and architecture and everything right so apart from that these central asian kingdoms where we can say relatively there is a political vacuum Polit- political void is there in the south we will see 
the we can say emergence of a great culture or a kind of civilization that is age of sangam or sangam age so it is it happened uh, broadly between the period of 300 bc to 300 ad so at this time uh, where the north india uh, relatively seen political instability so whenever there is political instability we kind of see a uh, we can say stagnation in the growth and development of art and architecture that to literature and uh, and so also the literature but this time uh, in the tamil country in the age of sangam we will say flourishing of literature and also in the fields of art and architecture so this uh, we can say period it is dominated by majorly three kingdoms those are the uh, earlier <coughs> cholas early cholas uh, we will see uh, after the i mean uh, at the origin of the medieval age so we will see later cholas also or uh, they are also called as the greater cholas right so apart from that there are cholas pandyas were there they were pandyas were dominant in the southernmost part of tamil nadu or southernmost part of peninsula and uh, the present kerala part that is dominated by cheras and the cheras alternatively also known as the kerala putras kerala putras so we will see a fierce battle between these three powers also so there is a tripartite tussle for the dominance over the for the dominance of this region especially the kaveri delta region kaveri basin right so this is the thing so uh, at the earlier part of the earlier part the cholas were dominant later the pandyas have uh, we can say kind of achieved the ascendancy and they were dominant right so there uh, there was a uh, whole and soul there was a tripartite tussle in this area so apart from that we will see a great flourish of uh, literature at that time in the southern part of the country right so this is the broad story uh, about the post mauryan age about the various dynasties and uh, after these dynasties we will again see a dominant kingdom establishing in the uh, northern part of india same place the patna or pataliputra as their capital the guptan empire has emerged guptan empire has emerged so we will see about the guptan empire and uh, guptan empire and important kings in the guptan empire in the next class right so we will broadly see the important dynasties and their the prominent leader, leaders in the all the, these uh, dynasties in this class right so some of the broad aspects that we see uh, during this period later uh, i mean later maurya period are trade and commerce it has improved because of the connectivity with the uh, trade routes of central asian regions art and architecture so we will see emergence of a special art that is gandhara art gandhara art and mathura art it is developed in and around mathura and in the northwestern part gandhara school of art has emerged so we will uh, see the flourishing of two styles of art that is mathura school and gandhara school of art so this gandhara school it included the greek or roman styles or influences we will see in the gandhara art whereas uh, the mathura art is purely indigenous one so apart from that gandhara there is a great association between gandhara art and the buddhism so mostly the art and architecture produced in the gandhara school is mostly is uh, buddhism however if we see mathura school of art we will see the three dominant religions uh, that is buddhism buddhism jainism and also hinduism so mostly on mathura we will see the influences of indian traditions gandhara school we will see the major influence of greek or roman features religion so all the religions major religions have flourished buddhism jainism and the Hindu, hinduism right however buddhism continued to be a major religion with the different schools emerging so hinduism also underwent significant transformations with the rise, rise of devotional movements 
centered around Vishnu and Shiva. So this particular devotional movement centered around Vishnu, it is known as Bhagavatism. Bhagavatism, right? Literature. So there is a growth and flourish, uh, flourish of Sanskrit literature also with epics like Mahabharata and Ramayana. They have gained more and more prominence. So apart from that, the Tamil Tamil Sangam literature also developed in South India. So this is the important development in this period, right? Right. So first dynasty is the Sunga dynasty. So I, earlier also I have told last class there was a I mean a small mistakes. I told the Maurya dynasty was ended by the Kanvas, but that is wrong. The Maurya dynasty was ended by the Sungas. Pushyamitra Sunga, he was the final founder of the dynasty. Pushyamitra Sunga, so he was the commander of the Mauryan armies. So he was a, I mean, he was a, we can say, a Hindu, a bit of radical ideas. So he killed the last ruler of my uh, Maurya dynasty, and he started the new dynasty, Sunga dynasty. Right. So Pushyamitra Sunga, uh, he ruled between 185 to 185 BC to 149 BC. He is the founder of the dynasty. He rose to power by overthrowing the last Mauryan emperor and established a new capital at the same place, Pataliputra. Right. So Shunga dynasty's resistance against Indo-Greek invasions is a significant achievement uh, during this reign. Apart from that, another prominent ruler is uh, there, Agnimitra Shunga. So he is the son and successor of Pushyamitra. Right. So he uh, featured in the famous uh, uh, play, Sanskrit play that is Malavika Agnimitram. Malavika Agnimitram. So, so Agnimitra mentioned in this play is this person only. Right. So it is written by Kalidasa. You know very well. So it is the he features in the play. Right. Malavika Agnimitram. Right. Next, uh, these are the two prominent rulers in the Sunga dynasty. After Sunga dynasty, Sunga dynasty was overthrown by the uh, Kanva dynasty, and uh, they, their uh, rule at Pataliputra is relatively a shorter one. <coughs> right. So, first ruler in this is Vasudeva Kanva. So, he is the founder of the dynasty. Historical accounts suggest that he rose to power by overthrowing uh, Sunga emperor. Devabhuti, right. So this dynasty is named after the uh, Gotra of Vasudeva Kanva, right. Next prominent ruler in this dynasty is the Bhumimitra. So he is son of Vasudeva Kanva and his successor also, right. Right. So if we see here the extent of Kanva rule confined to mostly the present day. Bihar and uh, Eastern UP and also some parts of Bengal, we will see the extent of Kanva dynasty. If you see the Pusha, I um, mean uh, the Sunga dynasty also, so whatever the control is there during the Maurya rule, Maurya rule it has been, I mean, declined and uh, we can say the territorial expansion is greatly declined during the Sunga rule. So because of the weak rulers after the Ashoka, uh, in the Maurya dynasty, the uh, rulers, I mean, they have been, they, I mean, we can say the distant parts of empire have been either declared independence or they are captured and occupied by other rulers. All right. So after uh, these two dynasties, one famous dynasty arose, famous rulers emerged, uh, emerged that is Satavahana rulers. So it witnessed many rulers over its long reign. So when political instability is there in the north, they have they kind of provided stability, stable rule over a period of time to the Indian. We can say in the, they have established a stable kingdom in the Indian subcontinent. Right. So some of the prominent rulers in the uh, Satavahana dynasty are Simuka. Right. So basically we will see the rule of Satavahanas from 200 and BC to uh, broadly around 200 to 250 AD. So from uh, 400 to 450 years uh, period of time, they have provided a stable rule. Right. So Simuka was the, I mean, he is the founder of the Satavahana dynasty. 
he is the uh, he is considered as the founder he established the dynasty uh, dynasty's foundation in the western deccan so you will uh, they will have different different uh, capitals uh, one of their capitals is dhanya kataka dhanya kataka also another capital later they have shifted to amaravati amaravati uh, more southwards or we can say southeast wards they have taken their capital and they have established their capital at amaravati right another prominent rulers are satakarni one he ruled between 70 bce to 60 bce so he he is a powerful uh, early ruler he expanded his kingdom kingdom significantly he conquered kalinga and pushed back the sungas extending control over parts of central india so because of that uh, i mean he also assumed the title of dakshina padapati i mean dakshina padapati means lord of uh, southern part or lord of deccan so he assumed the title dakshina padapati right next very very important ruler is uh, in the satavahana dynasty is gautami putra satakarni he ruled between 106 ad to 130 ad so he is widely wisely uh, widely considered as the greatest satavahana ruler right he revitalized the empire and after a uh, we can say brief period of decline he defeated the western chatrapas they are also known as the sakas these sakas are the one of the central asian rulers and significantly expanded the empire's territory right so he also started the practice of issuing uh <coughs> coins with the ruler's portrait i mean ruler's picture will be there on the coins next another very important or prominent ruler is vasishta putra kulumavi he ruled bit uh, he ruled between 130 uh, ad to 158 ad he is the successor and the son of the gautami putra satakarni uh, he continued the expansion of the empire and maintained its strength right so another prominent ruler is yagnasri satakarni he ruled between 164 and 184 so yagnasri satakarni is credited with recapturing the territories that lost to the resurgent western chatrapas right so i mean they were having the uh, they were having tussel with the sakars or western chatrapas uh, during their rule Uh, we can say at the end of the day the chatra uh, i mean western chatrapas they had the last laugh over the satavahanas however you can see <coughs> they could establish a vast kingdom <coughs> uh, during this period only providing a, providing a kind of uh, stable polity in those disturbed areas so first their capital was pratisthanapura later they have shifted to amravati right in the southern part of the country right so this is their territorial expansion okay right. so these are the three uh, we can say native or indigenous dynasties in the um, uh, post mauryan period now they have been certain central asian kingdoms also established and some part of india or indian subcontinent has become part and parcel of those central asian kingdoms also right so first among them is try to remember the chronology also so the chronology who came first so that is also can become a question in the examination so first uh, rulers to come and uh, capture some parts of india are the indo greeks right so if we see the territorial territorial expansion of the indo greeks so uh, mostly the parts of gujarat and some parts of rajasthan and also most of the upper indo gangetic plain has occupied by the indo greeks all right so this is their territorial expansion okay all right so if we see the some of the prominent rulers among the indo greeks first one is demetrius he ruled between 200 to 180 bc he is considered as the founder of the indo greek kingdom uh, so he led invasions into india Uh, from the indo-bactrian kingdom and established footholds in the northwestern regions so most prominent ruler uh, is the meander one 
so he ruled between 165 to 145 right meander 1 expanded the indo greek territory significantly and end the epithet suitor or savior possibly due to his just rule or conversion to buddhism right so his capital was at sagala present day sialkot pakistan right so another uh, rulers are there another prominent rulers are also there in the indo greek uh, indo greek dynasty right so the last uh, ras ruler is hermias he ruled between 90 to 700 bce right so he is one of the we can say last prominent rulers who ruled indo greek kingdom right next rulers are sakas so right they are also known as indo scythians right so they were uh, they weren't a single unified dynasty in india so there was a collection of various saka kshatrapas or they are also known as western kshatrapas and other saka kingdoms that emerged in the northwestern india roughly between 1st century bc and 4th century ad right so if you see the uh, the indo scythian kingdom or the saka kingdom uh, this is the extent of their kingdom right some of the prominent uh, i mean origin and arrival if you see the sakas were a collection of iranian nomads nomadic tribes originally from central asia around the 2nd century bce they migrated southward due to pressure from the other nomadic groups like uh, shangu so these are basically central asian and the chinese uh, tribes so because of pressure of them they ca- they have come further southwards right so rise of the saka kingdoms if you see the Sak- sakas displaced uh, displaced other groups like indo greeks establishing their own kingdoms in the northwestern india right so there are two were uh, two main branches of saka kshatras that is one one is western kshatras ruled in gujarat saurashtra and western maharashtra another branch sometimes called as kshaharatas uh, or eastern kshatras they ruled in areas like malwa and the western dakkan so here in the image you can see these are the western kshatras and these are the uh, other kshatras right so basically there are two we can say branches of the kshatras one was western kshatras another were eastern kshatras right so if you see the prominent rulers in the in this uh, in this dynasty so mauis azes uh, and uh, rudradaman you will uh, hear about rudradaman and his uh, famous inscription is there so rudradaman he is the most famous saka ruler known for his administrative reforms patronage of trade and uh, uh, promoting hinduism right so uh, one of the famous inscriptions that has been issued by rudradaman so uh, i mean the most of the details are coming from about that age that period coming from that particular inscription only right so next important ruler is nahapana so rudraman rudradaman and also nahapana they have engaged in continuous conflicts with the satavahanas who were ruling at the same period only so for the we can say fertile land of godavari basin there were conflicts between the satavahanas and the nahapana the gautami putra satakarni could could uh, defeat nahapana and uh, occupied most of the territory that was part of the uh, the satrapa kingdom at that time right right so when he defeated satavahana defeated gautami sorry the gautami putra satakarni defeated nahapana he assumed the title of kshaharata uh, vamsha nirvisheshakara so like that he has assumed some of the titles so one of the titles is kshaharata vamsha nirvisheshakara right next is indo parthians uh, another important we can say uh, uh, kingdom important dynasty so we can see the geographical extent of that dynasty here so indo parthian kingdom right so if you see the extent it is uh, comparatively lesser than the indo greeks and uh, the shakas however still it is a uh, prominent uh, we can say territory only right so the indo parthians were unique dynasty that arose in the northwestern india right so around the 1st century bce 
while the parthian empire dominated the western india indo parthians carved out their own space uh, blending parthian influence with local indian name right. so the famous most important ruler in the indo parthians is uh, the gondofarnes one so he is the most well known uh, indo parthian king uh, right so his evidence comes comes from various sources like coins silver and copper coins bearing his image and bilingual inscriptions both written in greek and kharosthi <coughs> of uh, sorry greek language and kharosthi script they are they offer uh, the most concrete proof about him the ox of thamas thomas they also give the evidence of gondofarnes right another inscription is there tag tibahi it also mentions about the gondofarnes right so this is about the uh, indo parthian parthian rulers they are also known as yavanas they are also alternatively known as yavanas right uh, the uh, most important dynasty uh, also last among these is the kushan kushan dynasty right you can see the geographical extent of Kush, kushan dynasty it uh, extended uh deep into the central asia also and also it extended uh in into the major part of the indo uh, sorry ganga yamuna uh, basin in the india right we can say in the central asian kingdoms it is the uh, it is the most prominent kingdom uh, established in the this region indo central asian region right if we see the major rulers in the kushan dynasty uh, first ruler is the Kujula card Physis. So he ruled between 30 and 80 BC. He is considered as the founder of the Kushan Empire. Kujula card Physis laid the groundwork, groundwork for its expansion. Right. He established their initial power base in Bactria and conquered territories in present-day Afghanistan, Pakistan. Right. Next there is a ruler, important ruler is Vima card Physis. So he is the son of Kujalkad, uh, Kujalkad Physis. He significantly expanded the Kushan Empire and uh, exp Empire Eastwa, eastwards into northwestern India. He conquered areas like Gandhara, Mathura, and established a strong foothold in the region. All right. So next, uh, the another or uh, most prominent ruler is the Kanishka, Kanishka the Great. So he ruled between 127 and 150 AD right so widely regarded as the most illustrious Kushan empire Kanishka reigned uh, reign marked the empire's golden age he was not only a skilled military leader uh, he is also known, known for his patronage towards the Buddhism and especially towards the art and architecture also right so he uh, significantly expanded the empire's borders and he is a very good i mean prominent or we can say a great pattern of uh, patron of buddhism and uh, he converted a major he convened uh, a major we can say buddhist council and promoted its growth and a significant contributor to the art and architecture also right so I think the fourth Buddhist council, it has been conducted at the, uh, I mean, during the tenure and uh, under the patronage of the Kanishka only, right. So next is uh, Huvishka, he ruled between 150 uh, AD and 180 AD, uh, the successor of Kanishka, he continued his father's legacy by promoting Buddhism and maintaining vast empire, right. He is known for his patronage of art and the construction of Buddhist monuments. Next is Vasudeva I. So here you can see how the names have changed from uh, Kujal Kardafaisis, Veem Kardafaisis, Kanishka, Huvishka and Vasudeva. So how the names are changing. So gradually they have not only Indianized but also they have Hinduized. They have started adopting the Indian and Hindu names so this vasudeva name it predominantly suggests the uh, bhagavata cult bhagavata cult or bhagavatism 
right right so vasudeva one is known for issuing a large number of coins indicating a period of economic prosperity he also maintained control over substantial territory despite facing challenges from external powers right so these are the some of the important rulers so kanishka is most more very 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 important uh, from the all spheres whether it is administration whether it is expansion whether it is patronage to religion and art and culture so if you see the importance of this dynasty briefly so a strong military leadership has been provided by the kushans the focus on trade and commerce has also given along the silk road a tolerant and multicultural environment that fostered artistic and religious exchange has also fulfilled during the rule of uh, kushans right so this is the these are the important aspects about the uh, uh, we can say later uh, maurya period of our post uh, post maurya period uh, and uh, the i mean we can say the uh, place is i mean the space is dominated by both the indigenous kingdoms and also the uh, i mean the dynasties that have basically crum, come come from the central asian regions right so till now there are i mean if you see the previous four to five years there is no direct question from this uh, we can say topic but uh, because uh, the area uh, i mean this topic is very significant and uh, examiner will have lot of scope for confusing the students so i am expecting a question from this uh, we can say topic uh, uh, in the coming upcoming examinations uh, so uh, try to keep an eye on the topic so apart from prelims apart from prelims the in the art and culture part also for the mains this uh, topics i mean this age becomes very very important because in the art and architecture arena we will see we see a very good development with the growth of different schools of art the mathura school of art the uh, gandhara school of art and in the south the amaravati school of school of art they have flourished like anything so from the art and uh, culture aspect also they are very very important right so this is it uh, for today thank you thank you for joining the class uh, see you next time until then have a good day right in the next class we will study about the guptans and the important aspects in the guptan right see you next time